Brasse, Vice President of Education for NAB Show. Thank you for joining us this morning for our general session, Making Sense of the Great Content Shift. Our presentation for this morning is the result of a pre and on-site crowdsourcing effort, one that we hope to expand for future shows. We invite you to join the conversation yourself at hashtag NAB Show. Beginning about a month ago, we asked our Twitter followers to weigh in on the theme for our conference, Making Sense of the Great Content Shift, through a tweet chat curated by GigaOM. The conversation continued here on site with a brainstorming roundtable discussion just this morning, which resulted in a few questions that will be discussed by our speaker, Marina Gorbis, during a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Andy Jordan from the Wall Street Journal following her presentation. We hope you'll enjoy the result. First, a few housekeeping notes. Please silence your cell phones and refrain from flash photography. And you can rate this session immediately following by using our mobile phone app. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Marina Gorbis. A native of Odessa, Ukraine, Gorbis is particularly suited to see things from a global perspective. She has worked all over the world and feels equally at home in Silicon Valley, Europe, India, or Kazakhstan. Before becoming Institute for the Future's Executive Director in 2006, Gorbis created the Global Innovation Forum, a project comparing innovation strategies in different regions around the world. And she founded Global Ethnographic Network, a multi-year ethnographic research program aimed at understanding daily lives of people in Brazil, Russia, India, China, and Silicon Valley. She also led IFTF's Technology Horizons program, focusing on interaction between technology and social organizations. She's currently writing a book on this topic called Social Structing, due out in January 2013. She's uniquely suited to help companies understand the seismic shifts happening and how people interconnect and innovate. Please welcome Marina Gorbis. Thank you, Denise, and good morning to all of you. It's early, I know, for particularly for Vegas, it's really early. <laughs> um, so let me ask you, how many of you have been to this show before in previous year? Pretty much everybody. How many have been coming for three years? Five? Yeah, quite a few people. So I bet in those, all those years you've been here, how many of you have heard about earth-shattering shifts, transformations that are happening in this industry? A few, okay. Indeed, it seems like no aspect of this industry has been unturned. Who creates content, which is pretty much everybody, and I'm gonna talk more about that. How they create it, what tools they're using, how, what equipment they're using, what processes they're using is all changing. Where they're creating content, not just what, what places they're using, but also where they're accessing content, where they're listening to it, viewing it. When they create it, which is pretty much any time, any place, in the car, on the go, what content is, is actually shifting, is Twitter, feed, a Twitter, a tweet, a content piece, a Facebook entry is a content piece. And why? Why are people doing it? Why are they doing I remember when first um, people were introduced to tw Twitter and I was doing presentation, a lot of people would ask me, why are you doing this? I don't get it. What is this all about? So indeed, no aspect of this industry has not been transformed. And it almost seems like you've been charting sort of a new territory in this domain and um, entering new worlds. And, and I bet you have some scars to show for it, right? Some of you and maybe some of your cam comrades that are not here anymore. Maybe they fell overboard along the way. And I just want to say thank you for, from the rest of us because you've been the first to experience the kind of transformations that are happening in every domain of our lives today. You've been the first ones, but it's happening in education, it's happening in health, it's happening everywhere, it's happening in our homes. All of this has been happening. 
And it almost, when you think about these kinds of transformation, this phrase from Sophocles comes to mind, nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse. No transformative technology that seems so exciting and full of possibilities doesn't come into our lives without its own set of challenges, its own set of issues that they're bringing along with them, as much as they are so exciting. And so I want to talk today about five, what I think are interesting, important aspects of this big transformation, both its positive, positive impacts and also some of its potential issues and challenges that they might be creating along the way. And of course, the first one I want to start with is something that's very familiar to all of you, which is pretty much everyone is a content creator. Everyone is a producer and creator of their own shows. You know that well. Um, used to be studios or people with a lot of resources, a lot of expensive equipment, um, a lot of organizational structure and management were able to do that only. And now it's pretty much everybody. Everybody with a cell phone and a camera and a YouTube account may be able to be a content creator and producer and the star of their own show. But what's interesting, that's just the beginning. The world we're going into is not just that everyone is a content creator, but pretty much everything is a content creator. And let me show you this article. Uh, so, sorry, I'm going to go in a slightly different direction. I just want to say that I am um, a fan of Mad Men. Not surprisingly, I bet many of you are in the same territory. Um, and so I eagerly tuned in to this program. Uh, along with 3.5 million people when the season, the fifth season was airing. But what I want to tell you, and it's a bit of a confession, is that last year for about a month, every morning, I would open my computer to this broadcast. Anybody else been watching this <laughs> broadcast? These are Shiba Inu puppies that I was watching. Uh, with a webcam in somebody's apartment somewhere in San Francisco. And so for about a month, every morning, I would open to this, and it will, the window will be open on my computer the whole day. And occasionally, when I have a moment, I would see what's happening with the puppies. And it was a lot of fun. And guess how many people tuned in to this broadcast? Guesses? 20 billion? <laughs> hmm, almost. 36 million people viewed this particular broadcast. So here's your math. Mad Men, 3.5 million, and Shiba Inu puppies, 36 million. And that's interesting. And now, of course, you can pretty much watch anything, any animal, any bird, any fish, any mammal that you're interested in are, are broadcasting something about themselves. These are just a slew of cameras that have been put on, on different in different places. So everyone and everything is becoming a broadcast. And how about these are animate things? How about inanimate things? How about objects? Anybody familiar with this object? If you get this kit from botanicals, which includes a moisture sensor and a radio transmitter, your t plant can be tweeting you. So if your plant is dry, it will send you this tweet, water me please, I'm thirsty, I'm so very thirsty. And if you're good enough to respond, and it's hard not to respond, respond to this tweet, right? You, I presume that most people would go and water their plants, then the plant will send you this very nice tweet, thanks for watering me, I love you. So truly, we're entering into the world where objects, think about it, what other things that are dear to you, you might want to put a sensor on and a radio transmitter and want to communicate with you. Probably many other things. In this project, as an example of this kind of prototype of things communicating with us, this is a dissertation by Josh and Karen Tannenbaum at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, and it's called the Reading Glove. And what it does is when you put this glove on and pick on an object, it tells you stories about itself, like this. 
When readers pick up objects from the surface, a fragment of audio narration associated with that object is triggered. I've been a spy in French occupied Algiers for several years now. I've been story. So think about it. These are RFID-enabled objects connected to web content. And if you pick them up, they tell stories about themselves. So we're truly entering a world in which every object, every device, everything we can lay our hands on is enveloped in the cloud of data. So everything becomes a content creator and a content broadcaster. And the question is, what are we going to do with all that? And what happens with content that's created not by humans, but created what I call algorithmically? So this is the second piece of the story, the second transformation that's interesting to talk about is algorithmic content. And by algorithmic content, I mean content that's created from data that's translated into stories or narratives using algorithms. So look at this particular story. This comes from, I think, a game, uh, Wisconsin versus University of Las Vegas. And it says, Wisconsin jumped out an early lead and never looked back in a 51 to 17 over UNLV on Thursday at Camp Randall Stadium. And so on, if you can read this. And I, I want to ask you, does it look like it's written by a human being? Does it look like it's written by a writer? Yeah, I think it's a pretty well-written story. Well, actually, there was no human involved in writing this story. This story was created by narrative science using an algorithm that looked at scores and statistics during the game and converted it into this narrative story that's virtually indistinguishable from what a writer would write. And this is because our capacity, our capabilities in understanding language and decoding language is getting very, a lot better. And our ability to create language that's natural language is also getting better. So this story is really about translating data into text. But how about translating data and creating narratives in more rich formats, maybe video? So I looked at this um, particular URL. This is a um, National Association of Broadcasters Wikipedia page. And then what you can do, you can put this URL or you can just type in National Association of Broadcasters into this platform called Quickie, and this is what you get. The National Association of Broadcasters is a trade association, workers union, and lobby group representing the interests of for profit over the air, radio, and television broadcasters in the United States. The NAB represents more than 8,300 and television stations as well as broadcast networks. As of November 1, 2009, the president and CEO of the NAB is Gordon Smith. So, this is, of course, the voice, voice is a bit robotic, right? But that's pretty good. If you think of it as a signal, this is a first. It's going to be getting better. Let's think about five, 10 years. But basically, what this platform does, it grabs content from the Wikipedia page with all its links in various formats, whether it's photos or videos or infographics and others, and basically creates a narrative. I put Institute for the Future and got a pretty interesting story out of it. So this is about data being converted into narratives and stories. But how about creating original content? How many of you have heard of the work of David Cope, composer? Not many. Um, David created a project called Experiments in Musical Intelligence, EMI. And what that project does, it analyzes music of particular composers, all of the scores, and basically creates original music in that composer's style. So this is what Bach sounds like. And so when expert musicians listen to this music, they actually couldn't tell it apart 
from actual Bach music. And today, if you go to his site, EMI Experiments in uh, Musical Intelligence, you, there are about 100 different uh, pieces that were created in different composer styles, from very short pieces to complete operas. So the exciting thing about all of this is there is lots and lots of content in rich media formats that being created, lots of it. But the question, of course, becomes, what about us humans, right? We've been pretty much taken out of manufacturing and production, wrote production jobs. In services, including road services, we're increasingly outsourcing that to machines, like call centers jobs and others. Anything that's routine and can be de deprogrammed and codified is being taken over. So for a while now, we've been, the pundits and others have been telling us that it's about the creative economy. It's about us being creative and creating new things. But these kinds of technologies and these kinds of tools kind of make us question that. What, what is creativity and what distinguishes us from other things that machines can do and are already beginning to do? And I think we're entering kind of a new kind of a partnership with our machines and machine intelligence and with our software. And the interesting thing about it is in the process, you think about all these pieces and what's cre being created, the stories, the musical scores and others, it could be that these will be first drafts of something that creatives will use to build on top or to verify, or it could be that we'll have to redefine what creativity is. It could be that what we think of creative is somebody who doesn't have one style that follows him or her through his lifetime, or, but it's something where you can't deprogram. Maybe it's somebody who spans classical music and hip hop and reggae and other pieces that cannot be programmed. But these are the kind of things that we're, we're going to have to grapple. What is the nature of this partnership with machines? What is our unique competitive advantage? What is it that we're doing? And what does it enable us to do that we previously were not able to do at all? So lots of content created by us, created by others, created by things, created by machines. And what are we going to be doing with all that content? And I think increasingly, and this is the third piece of the story, is that we're going to be designing our own reality. Now, there's been a lot of excitement about the Google Glasses. Anybody tried those yet? They're out there in beta somewhere, but they should be out by the end of the year. And basically what Google Glasses allow you to do is get information on the go. So instead of looking at your computer, you will be able to get information as you walk around and do various things in your life. But these are not true augmented reality glasses. They don't completely change what you actually see. So at the Institute for the Future, we design what we call artifacts from the future. My colleague Jason Tester is here in the audience. And this is an artifact from the future that he designed. And these are augmented reality glasses that you can wear that actually filter what you see in the physical world. So I have to tell you something about our artifacts from the future. We don't build them as prototypes of something that should be built, although sometimes they end up being that way. But really, the purpose of artifacts, so if you think of them, archaeologists, they dig up objects from the past, and they start conversations about why were people using this object? What was the story behind them? What kind of issues it created? So we're basically doing the same thing, but in the future. So imagine if you were digging into the future instead of the past, what might we find in that future? And it makes the future a lot more tangible and real. It provokes the right conversation. So imagine that we will have ability to basically change our reality as we walk around in the physical environment, in the physical world what we'll we be doing. And of course, we'll be doing some very exciting things, like take this street, and maybe you can actually augment it. You can see some, instead of with these glasses, you put them on, and maybe you can just see something really awesome. Not a, a string of cars, not all this dirty sidewalk, but maybe you can imagine this beautiful beach and the beautiful ocean. So 
we're going to be creating this augmented reality. But the other side of it is that maybe we will also be diminishing our reality. So maybe there are things that you don't want to see in your environment. Maybe you don't want to see uh, homeless people laying on the sidewalk, or maybe you don't want to see trash, or what all kinds of things that you want, don't want to see. So increasingly, we're entering the world where with these technologies, we are able to create and design the kind of reality that we are living in, the kind of reality that we want to experience. We're doing it somewhat already. We have been doing it. You know, we've always kind of designed our own reality. You can be sitting here but thinking about the beach and not listening to the presentation at all. And of course, uh, uh, with our devices, it gives us even more opportunities to not be present, right? You can be connected to your friends, you could be texting, you could be socializing, do, doing all kinds of things. But this makes it all even more possible in the physical world, where we're actually changing the physical reality of what we are seeing. And it creates a lot of issues. And it, it creates amazing possibilities. You can convert the street or the city into a game board. You can play out a movie. Into the, in the physical world or theater or all kinds of things. But the other question that it raises is, but who will be designing this reality for us? Um, this is, by the way, the technology that already enables. It's a technology produced by a German university that allows you to basically strip logos from, from things. So technology is, a, is in the work to basically enable us to filter this reality. But back to that question, who will be designing this reality for us? Is it others, or is it Google, or Apple, or whoever it's going to be that might be designing this reality for us? Are we going to be in control of our reality? We already hear about filter bubbles and the fact that we can design content that it is targeted to us and us personally, so we don't see the things that we don't want to see. But this is making it possible in the real world. And the question of control, who designs this reality for us, who filters it for us, how we filter it, becomes really important. So when you think about control, um, this comes to mind, remote control, right? How many uh, fights in the home start because of the remote control and the fights over remote, I know in my household, many. Or the other big challenge is where is the remote control, right? What, where did I put it last? It was just here. So we may be actually at the end of the time when we're controlling everything with remotes and with clicks because this is another piece of the story uh, another transformation that I think is worth paying attention to, we're entering this kind of no-click world, that content comes to us. We don't need to necessarily click to get it. So examples of that are all around us, the signals of this. So Siri, it's voice control, so no-click. Uh, Kinect, many TVs now um, enable you you to read your body, your gestures, your body language, and understand who you are, read who you are, and provide content specific to you. This is a very high resolution di display from Cal IT2 that use it for scientific displays. It's one of the higher resolution avail resolutions available out there. And, but these interfaces are becoming much more intimate. This is just the beginning, reading gestures, understanding who you are. Um, if you look at this device, it's called iBrain. And iBrain basically provides reading. Um, you put the strap on your forehead, and it provides electronics reading of your brain. Basically, it monitors your brain activity. And one of the first things that's being, being developed for is Stephen Hawking, who is, uh, uh, who is a physicist, a very famous physicist, but who suffers from Lou Gehrig disease and has trouble communicating, he can't really talk. And so what they've done is they strapped this device on him, and he wears it when he sleeps during the day. And basically, it's being translated into words, into audio. So of course, if, at first, these kinds of devices and tools will be used for people like Stephen Hawking or people with disabilities. But increasingly, 10 years, all of these devices that are basically used by very advanced users, uh, extreme users, 
are getting out there into the population. And these interfaces are getting much more intimate. I mean, imagine ability to understand your emotions, your facial expressions. There's obviously software that's doing that already. Um, there's things like this, ability to read your brain. And in that realm, which is pretty incredible, this is um, work by Brian Paisley at UC Berkeley where they basically decoded the content of people's visual images. So it's kind of hard to understand, but what they've done is they recorded um, brain waves of people watching YouTube videos. And so they can figure out what brain waves, what kind of brain activity is associated with different visual images. And, and this is what's allowing them to decode. So when they strap it to you, they can kind of decode what you're visualizing in your brain. So the next 10 years is a really an era of us decoding our brain. There's so much money being spent on this, so much research going on in that realm that um, clearly we're getting these kind of interfaces with no clicks, understanding who you are, what you're doing, what you're thinking, what you're emotionally, what you're feeling, it's gonna be getting out there into the world. And it creates a lot of, obviously, privacy issues, issues of um, limits, issues of boundaries, issues of control, again, and really the world, the good thing about it is that the world gets a lot more magical. It's almost like if you think about these interfaces, increasingly we're living in a much more magical world. Arthur Clarke, a, a fiction writer and futurist, said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And so we're really entering this realm where a lot of our technologies, they almost seem like magical around us. So if you think about theater or going to movies as a magical experience, this kind of magical experience really moves into a lot of other realms, into our homes, into our workplaces, into our environments. And it's a good thing, right, that we won't be fighting about remote controls but what other kinds of fights will we be engaging in? What kind of control issues will we be having to resolve? All of that is sort of up, up for grabs yet. Um, for example, one of the issues that we will have to resolve, and we all hear about the Internet of Things, but when all these devices around us are capturing all this data around us, Increasingly, it feels like the internet of watchers, right? It's like your adult supervision all around you, telling you and telling you and giving things on your behalf. So obviously, they're capturing a lot of data about us, and that will create enormous issues for us. How do we protect ourselves from that? How do we create some limits for that? Um, so. In this, all these streams of content, all these streams of data coming at us, all this content created by everybody um, creates a last set of sort of transformation that I think are important to think about is uh, what I call hacking attention. And this is an important one. Obviously, we're overwhelmed with content and all these streams, and there's just one, we were born with one sort of bug, um, design bug, is in that we don't multitask. As much as people try to convince you that they can do it, and I have several people at work who try to convince me that they actually can be in the meeting and they can be emailing and blogging and tweeting at the same time and they can hear everything perfectly, but study after study shows that there is no such thing as multitasking. This is a bug we were born with, and that even if you're doing a road task, one task, and doing something else, your performance on that something else deteriorates. Your memory deteriorates. Uh, your ability to interpret things deteriorates. So we don't really multitask when you, very well, and we don't like that, right? That's kind of a, a bug in us that we want to fix. Because what about all that great content? What about all those broadcasts? What about 
all those things that we want to access and others want to access. So increasingly, we're going to look for ways to hack, to expand our attention space, to communicate complex things in shorter, very tangible, very intense bursts to grab your attention. And we're going to bring out the big guns to do that, right? We're going to engage all of our senses to do that, from auditory to colors, visuals, everything we have in our arsenal. Um, now, we've come up with all these different things that we call uh, how we parse our attention, which is continuous partial attention. We can chunk attention, we can task switch, we can chunk time, we do all of that. But as I said, we don't multitask well. So what are we going to be doing? How are we going to be hacking our attention, expanding our attention space? And I think one way, as I said, it's to bring other senses as part of the arsenal. So I love this. This is an artist demo of the, um, it's called a stock market skirt. And I don't know, for some crazy reason, I have no idea why, but it seems to be consistent over time. When the market is bullish, when the stock market is going up, the, the, mini, uh, the skirt's length shortens. So people, are, women are wearing more mini skirts, the length shortens. And when the market is bearish, when it's going down, it's uh, going down. So Nancy Patterson, who is an artist, designs a skirt that's connected to the internet and it monitors the stock market prices. So when the prices, uh, when the stock market is up, the skirts go up and then when the market is down, um, the skirts length goes down. And that's just a clever, interesting, artistic interpretation of this ability to engage a lot more senses in communicating complex data. Another example of that, of course, from a scientific realm where they have to deal with a lot of very complex data. This is actually sonifying data that's coming in from the sun and it monitors solar storms on the sun and the data is being taken by two spacecraft. So if you are attuned to that, you can actually hear what's going on on the surface of the sun. But that's just one example. There are many examples. In fact, scientists are looking at all these ways to communicate complex data in rich visual or rich sensory auditory formats. This is just one example. I also like this example. This is a project called Emotional City, created by a Swedish designer. Um, and it's a city, you go to the site that he created, and you log in on a scale of one to seven, your mood, how well you're feeling, if you're happy or unhappy. And then some people have been projecting, so you, then you can collect this data from the whole city. And if you can project it on the building, if you're flying into an area, you can see the mood of the city in one basically very quick visual. So that becomes really interesting. And, and again, you can think of other uses for this kind of um, sensory interfaces. So this is just the beginning. This is another example of this. This is an emotional map of San Francisco. Um, and what this tells you is, um, it was created by giving people these devices that measure their galvanic response, which is a proxy for your stress level. And stress, of course, can be positive or negative. So people basically logged in. You could measure with a GPS. It's a GPS-enabled device. So people who were wearing it, and you could measure their stress level. And then if you aggregate that data, you can see what are the areas in, of the city where people are more stressed out. The bright red is where there's more stress and other areas are less stressed. And then you can engage in all kinds of um, things to, to alleviate that. Maybe you can put some greenery around or maybe you could slow down the traffic. But the idea is of translating very complex data and new kind of data that we were not able to access before into this very rich sensory formats. Um, that's a positive side of the story. So we can hack our attention by engaging all these senses. The negative side of the story is that attention becomes a commodity that 
attention becomes sort of medicalized in a way that we, if you think of, if you look at the data on use of drugs like Provigil, which keeps you awake, or any kind of attention drugs like Ritalin or Adderall, the numbers are just staggering. On a lot of campuses, 30% of students are taking these drugs for non-medical use. So they're taking them when they're studying for exams, they're taking them for, or they're taking them on a continuous basis to go to class. But so we're sort of medicalizing attention. It's interesting because in some ways, when you think about it, the physical things, we have unlimited appetite for physical things and we can accumulate basically infinite amount almost of physical thing. But our attention is a limited commodity. There are just 24 hours a day. And so we're going to try to grab those 24 hours of attention any way we can, whether through sensory interfaces or these kinds of medical interventions, which of course create all kinds of issues. For example, what is normal attention? We may be moving the norm somewhere. So those are the kind of issues that we will be grappling with as content is exploding, as we're able to access it, uh, in all these different formats when everybody and everything becomes a programmer, uh, becomes content creator and broadcaster. Um, so in, in the midst of all these transformations, with all this stuff going on, what is one thing that I think does not change? And that one thing is that we are wired for stories. Stories is what frames our lives. Stories is what gives meaning to our lives. This is how we communicate meaning in our lives. This is a story is a way of creating a shared experience for all of us and anthropologists studying different cultures. There's not a culture in the world, and there hasn't been, that hasn't been based on stories. So the challenge and the opportunity, I think, for the next 10 years is to be creating these kinds of stories in all these different content, in all these different, on all these different platforms, through all these different media, but the story is it. Um, this is actually, I'm gonna show you a clip um, uh, from a 1944 study where students were shown this very simple animation that had absolutely no meaning. It's just circle, triangles, a box, moving around. And when people watch this story, now only one person out of I don't know how many didn't think of it, there's some plot that was involved in the story. People really ascribed very deep emotions to all of these geometric things that are moving around. Of course, the triangles were men, and the circle was a woman, and the big triangle was a vicious thing trying to capture the young woman and the circle and the little triangle with young, innocent things. And it just tells you that no matter what, stories are really, really important. Stories are it. Stories are the killer app. And the challenge is to create these stories in all these different ways, in all the different environments, on all these different platforms. Yesterday we had a conference uh, sponsored by the Institute and the Wharton School uh, of Business, and um, what came out of that, uh, one of the participants said, we know what the killer app for bandwidth is. We were talking about the future of bandwidth. It's storytellers. It's always been and it always will be. And so the challenge to you is to continue creating these stories in new formats, on new platforms, with all these new tools to figure out who is the Dostoevsky for Twitter and what's an incredible uh, Facebook entry or whatever other technology that's coming in. Thank you. Do we sit down? Thank you so much, Rena. That was giving us a lot to think about. Uh, my name is Andy Jordan. I'm a multimedia reporter and editor at the Wall Street Journal and uh, have known the Institute for the Future team and Marina for, for quite a while. Um, we don't have a, a ton of time, so I want to jump right into this. Uh, I did want to tell you that if you have questions for Marina, you can hashtag tweet to NAB shift. Uh, and I will be following that up here, so hopefully we can get to some of your questions as well. But I'm going to be selfish and, and ask some of my own questions 
Uh, but narrative science, the example you gave, is really interesting to me when you talk about non-human content creators. I think everyone uh, potentially in this audience wants to know what is the value going forward for a human content creator? How can we work collaborati collaboratively with non-human content creators? Yeah, as I said, it's possible that these kind of stories, there might be some stories that can just be done by machines, by software, like taking scores and converting them into a story uh, without sort of human imprint or curation. That's one kind of a story. So if I were a writer, what would I do with the story? Okay, well, that's the first draft. Maybe I'll put my personal signature on that and around it. So there are some stories that can be done by machines. There are some places where you can use them as first draft, but there are other stories where there is no data. Right? If you right. look at fiction, if you look at a lot of other domains, it's not about converting data into stories. So a lot of those stories have not been written yet. And our world is evolving, our world is changing, so we'll have plenty of new stories to be writing about. So I don't think that everything is going to be automated. It's just that at the kind of a, I, I don't want to call it low level, but it's a level at which it's kind of codified. I think that everything that can be decoded, that can be sort of codified and reproduced will be. So you have to think about it. And there, you know, there's a good news story there too because there may be pieces of everybody's operations that can be codified and programmed and done by machine. And so it's more that's of a, a saving. Right, and it's a collaborative relationship. It's a collab I think ultimately it's a collaborative relationship. So you could see a scenario where a journalist might employ uh, this, this software algorithm to actually find the needle in the haystack. Yeah. Uh, and, and you can imagine a world where coders are working directly with storytellers. Right. Yeah. There's been examples in newsrooms where, for example, somebody's covering a trial and um, they outsource it to somebody in India to actually take notes during the mm -hmm. trial and create mm -hmm. their story. And then the reporter writes around it or takes that as a base. Mm -hmm. with with everyone being a content creator, and as you said, everything, uh, do you think that there's still room for, I, I've said, never underestimate the potential for particularly an American uh, audience to, to be lazy? They want to, you know, they want to sometimes have a lean back experience when it comes to television uh, and not necessarily be content creators. Do you think there's still room for that lean back experience in terms of content? Oh, absolutely. I, I do think there are times and places where people want the lean back experience. And, um, you know, if you look at, it would be interesting, I haven't seen data, but it would be interesting to see of all the amount of time we're spending on media, how much of that is a lean back experience and how much that has changed. And I'm not sure it's changed that much, but, you know, what's lean back is also maybe changing. So if you're watching a TV program and you're tweeting at the same time or you're communicating, is that a, that's not a complete lean back experience. But I do. I do think there's time and space for that mm -hmm. also. As the quantity of content goes up, everyone is a creator, everything is a creator. You talked about the attention hack. Uh, really, doesn't that just create more noise that we can't really, you know, a big, something I heard in the morning session, the brainstorm session was that, how do you differentiate content? How can you get people to your content when there's such noise? Yeah. Um, Obviously, every time we increase the amount of information or content, there's going to be a lot of junk out there. That's just going to continue. So there is a lot of junk. I, I think increasingly we're using our social networks as a filter for what's good. And sometimes people, people are also looking for novel experiences. So they're looking for novelty and they're looking for new ways to access it. So I think people are going to be using their social networks more and more to filter what is it that I want to listen to? But there was also pleasure of just discovering something completely unknown and completely new. And I bet somebody's going to create an algorithm if it hasn't been created yet to say, OK, you usually listen to this kind of music, but you've never listened to this kind of music. How about it? So exposing, you know, creating kind of these novelty algorithms in everything, mm -hmm. I think, would be mm -hmm. really interesting. It would help you get to the surface. Uh, I, Jen Clymer, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, but tweeted, how do we ensure quality of information? And this is similar to what we were talking about. As quantity goes up, will quality necessarily be an issue for the, the mass of, of content that we're creating? 
I think there's going to be all kinds of incredible content. I mean, you go back to the history of broadcasting and uh, television, what uh, General Sarnoff of RCA envisioned is that we're all going to be listening to classical music and being educated and, you know, we do all kinds of things with broadcast today. So there's going to be a lot of junk, but I think there's going to be also just some amazing stuff that's going to be happening. So. I, I do think that it's both, yeah, lots of junk, but some incredible new stuff also. Uh, something that came up in this morning session with Ryan, we were talking, someone said, uh, you know, you always hear the phrase content is king, uh, but now that brand is king, uh, in terms of convincing people, uh, Sutton Carey said, how do you convince people that they have a story worth telling? Uh, if everyone's gonna be telling a story and that's considered content, uh, how do you convince people that their story is worth telling? Um, I think it's a good old-fashioned way. How do you convince that some movie is good or not? How do you convince that the book is good? You, first of all, you have to produce amazing content. And I think the bar has gone up on content and getting attention. So I think that is happening. Um, you know, at the Institute, we always have fights. My colleagues are here. Uh, when we have meetings about lids down, lids up, right? And finally, I've given up and I said, fine, you know, whoever wants to listen. And what happens is if somebody's telling something really compelling, you watch people, they close their lids, they close mm -hmm. their computers. There is something in us, but the bar has gone up. You know, the bar on conference presentations has gone up with Ted and others. So the bar on getting attention has gone up. But if you have, if you're telling something really com compelling, I think people will pay attention. I did a story a few few years ago uh, about an attention currency called the Serios, which, right. which was uh, a little flag that go in, that that went in your uh, Outlook, and it, it helped. You had coins that you could spend to to let the receiver know that they were getting an important message. Do you see other sorts of attention hacks coming in in terms of uh, directing attention to content? I think. Um, so Sirius is a good example of using sort of gaming techniques and to get attention. And I think gaming techniques, gamers have figured out how to get attention, whether it's for 10 minutes or for hours a day. So I think that we're gonna see a lot of, not that everything will become a game or that Sirius is a, the way to go, but using those techniques and overlaying them on whatever serious stuff we're doing whether it's work or whether it's other things, um, that's one of the ways that we're gonna be getting attention. And I think that really creating sensory rich experiences and interfaces as an entry point also becomes important. It was a, an interesting day. Uh, a couple of days ago, the Huffington Post got a Pulitzer Prize, which was a first. Yep. Uh, Ariana Huffington and the Huffington Post is known as being you know, the king of aggregation. They do have original content, but do you see going forward, content creators moving more into this aggregator role rather than creating enterprise field-based content. Uh, and I, I'm thinking of a couple of apps, one called Tap2, uh, which is, that lets you DJ your own news. It's a little bit like Flipboard, mm -hmm. and you're able to sort of stream the news you want, uh, which is content in and of itself. Uh, Groupstream has just come out. Uh, Stitch It, stitch.it is an interesting app. Uh, do you see content creators moving more into this aggregator role where they create new content by aggregating other content? I think there's lots of Storyfy is another one, Scoop, uh, there are all kinds of content aggregators out there. I, again, I think there's, I don't think the actual original content creators are gonna be turning into aggregation. I think there's gonna be, all of us will be aggregating, you will be aggregating the content, and if I'm interested in what Andy wants to, read or listen to, I will look at it. Um, but I don't think that all the creators need to be turned into aggregators because what are you aggregating? Mm -hmm. You're still aggregating some content. Someone still has to create Right, content. so somebody still creates content. And maybe if everybody becomes a content aggregator or there are more of that, there's also more room for content creators to deliver very specialized content that can be aggregated. So mm -hmm. I actually want to ask that question for you. What do you think is going to happen? Well, I think it's going to be a combination, but I think you see, especially uh, a colleague of mine has created this app called stitch.it. So mm -hmm. you enter a bunch of URLs, and it actually creates this really interesting module where 
it's really just controlling the order in which you see the websites and it, and it right. does it seamlessly, but it's somebody else created that content. But in, in creating that order in that particular way of looking at it, you create your own right. kind of content. Right. Um, I think a, a large issue that I've been looking at is authentication and looking at uh, you know when, when you have especially non-human creators and is, is authenticity, uh, veracity, how can we make sure this content, from a journalist perspective, is coming from, you know, this happened with the Arab Spring, mm -hmm. uh, when you had all these people contributing cell phone videos of what was going on in Tahrir Square, uh, and then, you know, as journalists, we're put in the position of, how do we know this cell phone video actually right. came from Tahrir Square? Uh, and as you have non-journalists, citizen journalists contributing, I think that's gonna become more of an issue. Do you think, let me ask you then, do you think that content creation, especially in, in journalism terms, is going to become more collaborative than it even is in terms of uh, crowdsourcing and, and that's gonna become more common, don't you think? I, I definitely think that that's becoming more common and that's one piece of it, but I also think there is room for individual content creators and you know, we don't stop reading people who we really want to hear their unique opinion. Now, they may be using other sources and they may be getting to other sources. I think that what's happening is that we're used to individual content creators and journalists, and now the other piece is growing a lot more, so we're paying more attention to that. And so that piece of the pie is growing, and that's true, but I don't think that means that the death of individual content creator or individual journalists now, you may not be writing for the Wall Street Journal, you may be writing for multiple different places and the platforms may be different, but if I value your point of view, I'll continue reading your stuff. It's, it's really in a lot of ways uh, about the flow of information. It used to be that it was broadcasting in this term, this came up in the morning session, how do we, det how do we define broadcasting? Is that even a term we should be using? It used to be, it was one to many, you would broadcast one single message to as wide of, of an audience as possible. Now you have many to many, and as you mentioned, not necessarily the same message going to the same person, depending on how you're receiving the content mm -hmm. uh, and, and your preferences. Uh, do you, it, in a way, is that creating more complications in terms of if I'm going to, uh, you know, as the, the, uh, an article I was reading on narrative science says, if I read The Economist, uh, am I gonna get a slightly different story than, uh, you know, someone who looks at TMZ all the time? Oh, yeah. You know, but, to, with this customized reality you were speaking of. But in a way, we've always done that. The story you get from Fox News compared to MSNBC is very different, right? right? So we choose which channels we're listening to. And I, I do think it's a problem with, in terms of our filtering that, you know, if we're only going to be listening and viewing what, what I am interested in and not paying attention to anything else, you get a very narrow channel. And that's one of those curses of this. But I do think it would be interesting. And I think people are working on kind of serendipity engines the, the software that will point you to something completely different right. and kind of actually expand your view of point of view. Because it's a problem you, in, in terms of you're getting confirmation of beliefs you already hold to be true. So it's Absolutely. not really. So we're just extending, but that's already true. You know, there's all this brain research that shows that we make up our mind before we hear the facts. And the facts, basically, we filter to just prove whatever we were believing in. So we're not a fact-based being. You know, we're not a rational mm -hmm. uh, entity ourselves. So we're just extending it into all this other media. You know, this is the thing about technology. Um, technology, it's not that, you know, McLuhan's, uh, we build our technologies and our technologies reinvent us we still have some basic needs, basic sort of ways that we operate, and each generation of technology allows us to fulfill those needs in new ways. So what you're seeing is we always have this confirmation bias and the fact that we're listening to what we believe in, the belief is primary, the facts, we don't really listen to facts that much. Um, it would be interesting to develop some technologies to make us listen to facts a little more. Uh, but in a way, this is an extension of what we've been doing. It maybe is exaggerated with this media, but it's, it's kind of not a new story. If you were uh, a CEO of a content creation company, 
uh, many of them want to know what are the, the key business opportunities going forward with, with creating content. Yeah. Do you put your money into sending people out into the field or do you aggregate? What, uh, what is the best business strategy going forward? You know, forward? I actually believe that there is no business model, one business model that you would pursue. I think there's multiple business models. And in some ways, you know, technology is something that's easier to foresee. You know what's being developed in the lab, you know what technologies are out there and how they might come together. What's much more difficult to foresee is social implications. Once technology gets out there into the wild, it sort of gets wild. So I, I do think it's an era of prototyping, you know, trying things, little things here and there, see if you can scale up. I think the business model is to have lots and lots of prototypes, beta tests, different models, different ideas, see which ones work and scale it if you can. And some of them don't need to be scaled. Mm -hmm. Some of them can stay small. So right. I don't think there is like one business model. I would say that, you know, if I were thinking of like, ideal um, profession or ideal, like if somebody were asking, I'm going to college and what should I learn? Um, I, I would say besides just learn what you're passionate about and what you're willing to do, even if somebody, nobody pays you to do it. Um, I would say it's a combination of understanding data, data analytics, uh, programming and art. I think it's a killer combination because really what we're talking about is taking a lot of data converting it into very interesting content and art forms. And there are not many people who combine those skills of data analysis, programming, and art, whatever art form, whether it's music or visual arts or any other form. Yeah, I know a lot of the people being hired in, in journalism now are coder uh, journalists that can code, but can use that coding to tell stories. Right. Uh, Denise, do we want to ask, have some people in the audience ask questions? Does anybody have a question? I think if you just walk up to that mic, hopefully that will, that will work. As you've emphasized, and, and given the extraordinary demands on our time, what are the sources you would recommend that we follow in order to keep up with what's going on, particularly in the scientific and developmental areas? Um, you, you may. You follow IFC of Twitter. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm actually serious. Um, I, a lot of people, I said when I started using tw Twitter, and I would talk to audiences, people would go, "Why are you doing this? It's such a waste of time." I think Twitter is a huge for us signals database. So our methodology is based on looking at signals, something that's being done in, on small scale, uh, that few people may be doing. That seems out of ordinary, it may be research, it may be some usage, and people are posting. If you set your Twitter uh, on the right content providers, and I'm thinking, yes, Institute for the Future, New Scientist magazine, uh, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, Science Park, they, they give such rich information, and that's your entry. So to me, I open my computer to Twitter or my cell phone or my phone and I start with that and then it gets me, it's my entry point to all the content. If, and if you set, if you follow the right sites, the right people, like I mentioned New Scientist, uh, New York Times Science, other kinds of things, you, you get there. And it's your social community, yeah. What about you? Uh, this is an interesting question uh, that came up in the morning session in terms of measurement and when you have all different kinds of content. On TV, of course, we have rating systems and uh, the FCC, of course, uh, regulates broadcast media. Uh, someone in the audience asked, is there any need for an FCC of online content, more specifically nonfiction, uh, that's similar to the certification system for content on TV? Are we getting into tricky territory there when you want to start Certifying. regulating content? I internet. do think we get into very tricky territory, and I bet there's going to be a lot of pushback to that. I mean, people are kind of, we have a rating system, right, by people, you know, how many Twitter followers your, your content piece, how much it's been retweeted. If you go to the New York Times, sorry, it's a <laughs> competitor organization, maybe the Wall Street Journal has the same. They have this amazing, in their R&D lab, they have this amazing wall visualization that basically follows the path of every tweet. So you can see average tweet gets retweeted if it's successful over five days. And you can see, you can actually see what happens, the life of your tweet. So that's a measure right there. Sure. 
sure it's in a, and it's in the social realm. Anyone else have a question? All right. Um, we know that we can't uh, multitask. And yet, when we began the sit-down, the first thing you requested is send your questions in on Twitter. Right. So now, now we're sitting here, and we're trying to type out our questions. And, and pay like, attention. And that was a test. Just, yeah, what did you just do? Because we can't write and listen at the same time. So where do we draw that line to bring in the technology to give us the questions? Or, <laughs> you know, where do we, what do we do about that? Eventually, it will probably read your thoughts and you don't have to tweet, right? If you take that eye brain thing. But seriously, um, we just did this project on the future of work and we talked about key skills for the future in the workforce. And one of those skills is cognitive load management. You need to figure out your own, how you manage your cognitive load, whether you are capable of tweeting and tuning back into the conversation or you're not, and those are, I think, very early on. Unfortunately, we don't teach kids in school about this, that how do you manage all these streams coming in? And it's an individual thing. For example, I just did a test on how good I am on multitasking, and I'm average, but I'm really good at switching tasks. Like, I was, my score was way out there. And that's a good thing to know, so I can go back and forth and, and do things. So. Um, it's an individual measure. I, I don't think that anybody will come in and unless your device actually stops you from doing it, which is possible, you know, there are now technologies that basically stop your phone from working in the car, right? So that's like big brother technologies that will be coming in and probably you will be using with your kids. But other than that, it's self-management and knowing. these. Platforms and these technologies are new. We don't have a lot of experience with them. We're very excited about them. We jump on them, and or some people just dismiss them altogether and don't jump on it. It's something we're experimenting with. And eventually, I think, you know, over 10 years of use, you kind of learn to manage yourself and your attention and know what works or not. I think we have time for one more question. Go for it. Thank you. Um, given the opportunity for us to filter out uh, the things that we are not interested in and and accept or access the things that we are most interested in it's su things it suggests to me that there's an opportunity to reinforce our own prejudices and biases and opinions and filter out anything that we may disagree with do you think there's a case to be made because of that trend I suppose uh, for a case to be made and perhaps a need for greater liberal education as a mandatory component of education? I'm a big believer in liberal arts education. I'm a big believer in, you know, the thing about liberal arts education and not just, you know, so critical thinking skills absolutely become essential because there's so much stuff out there and how you navigate all that. How, how do you navigate the world? But it's, nobody has really come up with a good explanation of what is it? How do you build critical skills? Uh, critical thinking skills. What does it take? Um, you know, is it about learning philosophy? Is it about designing things? It's, is it about work experiences and learning just to navigate? And I think all kinds of, you know, any kind of specialized experience where you're just learning this, it's not going to make it. You need to be, um, at IBM, they have this notion of T people, T shaped people. So you need to be deeply versed in one discipline, and then you need to be able to go across. You need to know a lot, you need to know something deeply, maybe in one area, and then you need to know a lot of things broadly. I think that's the era we're in. But in terms of confirming, with, when you end up with content creators and media organizations that really go out, and uh, present a, per a certain perspective, uh, it's, a, it's a good business prospect for them. If I'm going to have an audience that I know prefers a certain kind of news or content or perspective, doesn't it make business sense to go and, and tailor your news to them? Do you see us coming back from that model? Because inevitably we have to figure out how to scale and make money off of yeah, I think that's a very hard proposition. I mean, we're doing it in our political system, right? The candidates are telling us right. what the voters want to hear. So it's, it's sort of pervasive in, in all of our lives. I wish that more broadcast organizations would go out on a limb, and, and some do. I mean, there are amazing things happening in, in broadcast, in TV, in radio, online, where people's opinions do change. Right. And 
I, I think that's very important, and there are multiple ways of doing it. I don't think it's about presenting data. I think that's an opportunity is to reach, uh, to, to get all these rich sensory interfaces to change people's minds. Marina Gorvis from the Institute for the Future, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. IFTF.org. IFTF.org, yes. Thank you guys for coming, and the next super session takes place at 2.15 in this room.